We are here with Opa, August 2019, and we're going to have him tell us about when he got in a ski accident and broke his legs, and first time he had pizza from his favorite pizza place. Okay, I'm going to give this story just a little bit of a twist. Uh, when I just told Thane uh, today for the first time. Uh, when I was 15 years old, we moved from Centerville to Salt Lake City, actually on Millbrook Road, 1771 Millbrook Road. And uh, uh, I was a sophomore at Granite High School. And uh, uh, I had been skiing a lot, I'm uh, not a lot, I had been skiing maybe uh, one or two times a month because to get from Centerville to Alta or Brighton was kind of a difficult trip. Uh, plus, my parents didn't really support my skiing all that much at the time. But nevertheless, uh, I got involved with a bunch of guys on the Granite High ski team and uh, they convinced me that I should enjoy that I should enter a ski race put on by Deseret News. Uh, as a matter of fact, they put on about five of those ski races, which were all juniors, everybody under the age of 18. Uh, they put on about four or five a winter season. And because I had never raced before, uh, uh, they put me in C category, means the lowest possible category. And it was a downhill race. And uh, uh, in that race, uh, for those of you who have skied uh, uh, Alta, it started at the, up, at the upper end of the Peruvian lift, went straight down across, uh, and then down the uh, more eastern side uh, of where the main uh, ski areas were. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I ended up taking second place overall. The only guy that beat me was Marv Melville, who later uh, became Olympia, an Olympian skier. So anyway, it was in my blood. And downhill racing was my forte. Okay, so now we have to jump forward a little bit. Uh, I ended up getting a scholarship, a skiing scholarship at the University of Utah. And uh, in those days, uh, the University of Utah would not bring over Norwegians or Scandinavians for jumping. So anybody who would do the alpine skiing, that means downhill or slalom, uh, we had to choose one event uh, that is called a Nordic event. That means cross country or jumping. So I decided to choose jumping because cross country didn't excite me at all. Uh, uh, in February, and I'm thinking it was very close to February the 15th, it was a warm spring day and uh, I was, by this time, I was a freshman at the University of Utah. And uh, we went up on a Wednesday at about three o'clock in the afternoon to a jump that used to be just above Hogel Zoo. Uh, uh, there were about 15 of us, but we were all getting ready to jump on a major op uh, a competition the coming uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so we all made maybe two or three jumps and it was about six o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon and it, uh, that day had been relatively warm so the snow was on the wet side and uh, the jump at that point, uh, the in run, <clears throat> you could uh, make it as high as you wanted uh, and because it had been a wet day, <clears throat> We started the in run probably 15 or 20 feet higher than what would have been normal. Okay, so after the fourth or fifth jump, you know, we could just simply go one after the other after the other. Uh, 
there was a parking lot right there at the end of the outrun. And uh, I had a major accounting test the next day. And so I told the guys I wasn't going to take another jump that I needed the time to study for that test uh, the following morning. And they all begged and pleaded and one thing and another. And it ended up, they said, if you, if you come up with us on this last jump, you can be the first one to jump. And then you can just simply get in your car and go without waiting for the rest of us. So they talked me into it. And the thing I remember most is that I, it was almost like I had a guilty conscience, you know, that I shouldn't be doing this. But at the time I thought, well, I can make up for it. I'll just study uh, extra hours this evening. So I was the first one to jump. Uh, in the meantime, the temperature had dropped from probably around 40 or 50 degrees, uh, you know, a warm spring day, down to, well, maybe 10 or 20 degrees. Well, you couldn't notice it when you were climbing up the hill to get ready to jump uh, because all that, uh, <clears throat> the air becoming colder, all it did is it put a tiny thin ice film on top of the wet snow. But it was so tiny you didn't notice it. But our ski jumping skis in those days were eight foot long and very wide and so when we, and I was the first one to go, uh, and the minute I started going down the hill, by the time I got to the lip, the lip is where the jump is, where you're supposed to spring. And by the time I got there, I knew I was going much, much too fast. And uh, uh, so obviously I'm in the air and so, and I'm, I noticed that I'm just going too fast. And so I start pumping my arms backwards, which is a method that you use to drop altitude as fast as you can. Uh, it wasn't enough. And the net result is, is that I uh, out jumped the hill and lit at the flat, probably about 180, 150 to 180 feet on the jump. And my legs obviously, uh, you see, normally when you land on a jump, uh, uh, the hill is descending about the same as well as your flight is descending. So when you hit, it's it's very light. You don't really notice it very much. But when you do, when you out jump the hill, then you really have an impact. Well, I had an impact, and uh, unfortunately. Uh, I did the splits with those eight foot long hickory uh, skis. Each uh, ski weighed probably a little more than two normal uh, slalom skis together. And uh, all I remember is the worst pain of anything that I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, broke both legs. Uh, the, uh, my left leg was very lightly broken, kind of like more cracked, but the right leg twisted and turned with the, and the ski didn't come off. And I remember when I stopped, I just pounded the, uh, the pain was so great that I just pounded my fist on the snow, you know, and I was actually screaming, not crying. Ah! I was screaming, screaming. And that lasted probably 10 or 15 seconds. And then I guess your body goes into shock because the pain did go away. And then I sit there on the snow and I'm thinking, well, I wonder how bad I'm hurt because at that moment, the pain was gone. And uh, uh, so I saw my ski out there lying on horizontal on the end of my leg. And I thought, well, I'll try to twist my leg and raise the ski. So I felt the bones turn in my right leg, but the ski didn't lift up. So anyway, so the net result is, is that somebody called and they brought an ambulance right up uh, and loaded me on the ambulance and, and took me first to one hospital and then they transferred me to the LDS hospital. And they put a body cast on me that went from the tippy toes 
up to just under my armpits. And at the knee, uh, at the knees, they put a, a wooden bar across. I mean, this is a cast like, like the old Egyptians used to uh, uh, wrap up their dead. So I'm totally immobile. And uh, of course, the reason you have that cross piece at your knees is because they have to carve out a chunk of your ga of your cast so that you can go to the bathroom both ways, which is embarrassing and difficult. Uh, and uh, they brought in a hospital bed, which had an iron bar above it and a triangle. And uh, I would grab that thing and pull myself up maybe six or eight inches. My mother would slip in a bedpan and I would do my business. Uh, as, a, <laughs> as a comical, side to this story, uh, the only way I could pee, obviously, was uh, into a bottle. Uh, and so I always had a, a, either a quart, I think it was a quart bottle. And at that time, for whatever reason, and I don't even know today why, but my sister Margaret and I didn't have a good relationship. Uh, I was always a teaser, and she did not like to be teased. And I think over the years that had become worse and worse. And so uh, part of my trickery was to hold everything in my bladder as long as possible because Margaret was the one that was assigned, uh, you know, after she came home from school to go empty the bottle. And I got to the point where I could fill that bottle up to almost seven-eighths and Margaret would gag and cry and, and why don't you go more often and, so I can put a top on it and it won't spill and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, that's the end. I, was in, I ended up in the hospital probably for about a month before they took me home. Uh, and then I, uh, I was at home for probably another five months then they took me back to the hospital, carved off the cast, uh, and put a new cast on. And of course, after lying absolutely still and not being able to move a muscle other than my arms and hands, my legs just deteriorated. <laughs> my thighs were just, that had before become extremely muscly and now the skin was just hanging and there was no muscle structure. And right at the knee, it bulged out. And then at the calf, it became very skinny. And, and I always had big calves. And at this point, it's just flabby old skin, just you know, like a 80-year-old man, which I am now. Anyway, one thing you find out when you get hurt and you're in bed for a real long time is that you get a lot of visitors the first week and about half as many the second week. But by the time a month has gone by, only your true blue friends show up. And I had uh, maybe two or three friends uh, that showed up uh, very regularly. One was Judy Christensen, who lived across the street and ended up marrying... Lyle Condy, who ended up becoming a great basketball player. Uh, uh, and to my surprise, one day uh, in comes a guy that I had only met two or three times in, uh, uh, at school at an accounting lab. And uh, in the accounting labs, they threw two people together to do the lab work. And, and he was... I was probably 19 at the time, and he was by, probably 22 or 23, out of the army. He had been in the army and uh, uh, and back. His name was Kay Christensen, and he later changed his name to Bill Christensen. He was about six foot four, probably weighed 200 pounds, and was very muscly, and played softball, and he could toss a softball as fast as a bullet. Uh, Anyway, he shows up uh, because when I didn't show up at lab, at the accounting lab, he went down to the admission 
admissions office and managed to get the fact that I had dropped out of school and uh, let's see, I dropped out of school and they didn't have any other information, but he got, so he just simply he got in his car and found our address and drove. And that was at about the two month mark. You know, I'd probably been home from the hospital uh, one month at that point in time. And while I was there, I was really surprised to see him. I mean, you know, it only met, it met each other twice before. Uh, anyway, Bill or Kay came to visit me at least twice a week, maybe three times for all the rest of the six or seven months that I was, uh, I was in that, uh, in that cast. And the very first time he came, he said, uh, I'm going to meet somebody and we're going to go have pizza. And I said, what is pizza? It was unknown at the time. There was only one pizza place in all of Salt Lake City, and it was called the Pizza Oven, Yum. run by, uh, on 21st, uh, 21st Street? 21st South. 21st South, uh, Maybe probably 21st about East. 9th East. Oh, okay. And uh, he said, if you, and I said, what's pizza? And he described it to me. He said, oh, it's the best dish the best dish that you can possibly imagine. And he's, uh, he's, uh, I said, well, I kind of like cheese dishes. So uh, anyway, he offered to bring one. So the next time he came to visit, he bought a, he bought a uh, 16 incher, a bigger, a big one with nothing but double pepperoni and double sausage with the, with the uh, cheese and the, and the sauce. And the first bite, I fell in love with what became my favorite food for years and years to come. And no matter where I went, whether it was in Europe or if it was in America, anytime I had pizza, I would judge how good it was based upon how authentic the taste was to the, the pizza oven. And as a matter of fact, uh, even after I had graduated and then moved to Chicago and moved to Washington, D.C., when I would ever come back to Salt Lake City, uh, I would go back to the pizza oven, uh, which uh, was owned by an Italian family. <laughs> and there were two girls that were lovely Italian girls. Keep one, them G-rated. This is for the grandkids. One was named Ruby. But the Ruby was the one I liked. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there were a lot of Italians in Salt Lake at that time, and they had an Italian days. And these two girls ended up becoming the, uh, the one was the queen and the other one was the first attendant, beauties. And we, uh, Kay and I, dated these two girls uh, off and on. And one time, uh, I, was, I thought Ruby was really something special. I don't wanted to kind of become exclusive or, or go steady. And she says, I can't. And I said, well, why not? And she says, because you're not Italian. Mm -hmm. And I says, well, uh, your uncle, who's the one that, and her grandpa, they were the ones that owned this pizza oven. I said, they like me. They'll, uh, uh, they'll give me a good report to your parents. And, uh, uh, she says, well, I'll, I'll ask. And, it's, uh, and uh, so she eventually got her parents' permission, uh, and Kay and I went with uh, Ruby and whatever the other one's name to have spaghetti at the parents' house. Mm -hmm. And so before we went, uh, the two girls took us to an Italian restaurant and to teach us how we had to eat in order that their parents would be impressed. And this had to do with winding the fork in a spoon and, and eating it uh, upside down fork. The girls were, uh, well, well, they were probably four or five years younger than Kay. And I think maybe two or three years younger than me. And anyway, after this big dinner, the father came up and, shook our hands, still had a heavy Italian ac accent, 
and said, I like you boys, but you were born in the wrong land of the wrong people, and you're too old for my daughters. Smart so that, guy. That was the end of that romance. Sounds okay, good. Okay, that's the end of the pizza story and the broken leg story. Perfect. My memory of pizza oven is when we lived in Utah from about uh, 1977 to whenever, we'd, we'd go out to a pizza oven and always got the pepperoni sausage for one of them and, and some others. We'd sit around as a family and eat them. And I don't know if we ever had fresca anywhere else, but we always got a fresca at the pizza oven. I love drinking a fresca. Thanks for watching. Thanks for Opa for sharing and we'll catch you later. Opa did want to add that this experience really turned his life around, got him more focused on spiritual things, and eventually out on a mission. That was an important part of the story. So that yellow bike you just saw was from a museum. We went to Forney Museum, a 1971 Schwinn, and the bike I was out riding was a 1974 Schwinn that Dad bought brand new back in 1974. Here's a one more picture from the Forney Museum. We appreciate Opa sharing his stories and we invite you to subscribe by clicking on top or watch my next video by clicking on the bottom. Thanks everyone!